Good afternoon. I am Gregory Washington, the president of George Mason University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Russia's war on Ukraine in a historical perspective. Our Russian and Eurasian studies program developed this 12 part series as part of a course Mason faculty are teaching on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The goal of this series is to present the work of 12 scholars and writers from around the world. Their insights help us to understand the historical relationship between Russia and Ukraine, the invasion itself, and the remarkable resistance of the Ukrainian people. Through the perspective of these historians, we are better able to comprehend the war in Ukraine in a broader context. This series is an illustration of how humanities research in a public research university can create knowledge, spur discussion, and expand understanding of complex global issues. We appreciate your viewership of this series, and we are proud that George Mason University can bring it to you. Enjoy. Well, uh, I'm sure most of you by now have seen this video many times. Um, and like me, you probably feel that President Washington's kind of part of the family uh, and will surely be coming for Thanksgiving dinner uh, this week. Seriously, though, I'm, I'm very grateful to the university president and his staff uh, for their desire to mark the importance of what we're doing here uh, and how public universities like ours can make things like this happen. Uh, so I'm Professor Steve Barnes of George Mason University, uh, and along with our speaker of the day, we have here Jessica Dotrieve, uh, who's a PhD candidate here in U.S. history at Mason. Uh, today is the penultimate event in the series with the well-known Anne Applebaum slated to join us next Monday to close out the series. Don't fret, though, because this is not going to be the end of conversations at George Mason about Russia's criminal war in Ukraine. Please keep an eye on the events calendar uh, for the program in Russian and Eurasian Studies uh, as we look to add events uh, as we move into the spring semester in January. And please note that we've added one special event to this semester's calendar. On Tuesday, November 29th, a week from tomorrow at 3 p.m., the day after Ann Applebaum closes out this series, uh, we will host an art historian, Svetlana Shields, uh, who used to teach here at Mason, uh, and she'll give a talk entitled, Can Ukrainian Art Explain Why Russia Launched the War Against Ukraine? Uh, that will also be online, and you can register at the link that Jessica is sharing with you. Uh, again, I'll also urge that if you have people or topics that you'd like to hear uh, discussed in the spring semester, uh, I'll be turning to organizing those events as soon as this semester schedule concludes, uh, and so there's still time to reach out to me via email or on Twitter uh, to make your requests. And please note that although Cynthia Hooper and I are taking a break this week from our Friday Q&A sessions uh, with the Thanksgiving holiday here in the United States, uh, we will be back on Friday, December 2nd, uh, and we hope that day we'll have a session focused on China's position uh, relative to Russia's war on Ukraine. So welcome again, everybody, to my class, History 388, Russia's War in Ukraine in Historical Perspective. Uh, and welcome to the series that was made possible through the support of the program in Russian and Eurasian Studies, the Department of History and Art History, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, all parts here of our George Mason University community. We come to you today on, interestingly, the ninth anniversary of Afghan-Ukrainian journalist Mustafa Nayem's posting on Facebook uh, that people needed to come out to the Maidan in Kiev to protest Yanukovych's decision to withdraw from the negotiations of an association agreement with the European Union. As Marcy Shore memorably told us in her lecture in this series, Nayem wrote, likes don't count. This launched what would come to be called the Revolution of Dignity or the Maidan Revolution. This was not the first time, but it was an important moment in showing us the way that Ukrainians were going to be willing to stand up and fight for their country and for its future. Today, we're going to hear much more about what the Ukrainian people think. 
But let's first remind ourselves how important it is that we continue to support Ukrainians through what will be a difficult winter. Now is the time. If you haven't yet made a donation, and if you've enjoyed this series, and if you are able, please go to Razum for Ukraine and support this organization that provides humanitarian assistance and support on the ground in Ukraine. I'm so excited to introduce today's speaker, my colleague for all the years that I've been here at Mason. Uh, we realized we started at about the same time, uh, a great friend uh, and a phenomenal and dynamic and truly indefatigable scholar. Uh, professor Karina Corstellina is a professor in the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution here at George Mason. She also directs the Peace Lab on Reconciling Conflict and Intergroup Divisions. She is herself from Ukraine. And by the way, we would run out of time before I could share with you all of the titles of her 16 books and 93 articles. She writes so fast and so furious that I'll always remember a visit to her office when I saw on the door of her office flyers for launch parties for not one, but two books that she had written at essentially the same time. Uh, I'm really not sure that Dr. Korstelina ever sleeps. She's long focused on identity-based conflicts around the world, but she has always had Ukraine as a special focus of her work. I've had the great pleasure of sitting on dissertation committees for some of her PhD students who followed her lead in studying the role of historical memory identity and conflict. So while we've invited a social scientist to crash our little historian's party this semester, there are few who are better situated to help us understand the role of history in our present, and especially in the present of Ukraine. I invite you to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A feature on Zoom, and I'll ask as many as I'm able. And with that, Karina, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. You're so kind, extremely kind. I humble by your presentation. And it's wonderful to have you as a colleague and work with you for all these years. So let me see if I can uh, share screen and start. Um, now I can start. Uh, okay, slideshow. Slideshow from Okay, now you can see it, right? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So thank you again. Um, so this particular presentation, I will be not speaking about war in Ukraine itself. We started, you already very well prepared uh, to uh, understand all its dynamics. And I will go directly into what I want to share with you. So the while we were looking into what happening in Ukraine, uh, a lot of opinion pieces start published everywhere. And we start thinking, what really Ukrainians think? How we can see how Ukrainians support peace or support war, how they affected by the war. So we applied for National Science Foundation and were able to receive um, support for conducting first survey and also the uh, interviews focus group with group with people. So we focus specifically on how people experience war and how their experience of war shapes their attitudes, emotion, perceptions of war and peace. So what we so far in this um, trying to see so far what we did, um, based, we conduct, we analyzed several very important theoretical conceptual ideas. First of all, how war experiences shape attitudes toward peace agreements and toward support of the peace. And we found that literature, first of all, is not consistent on either exposure to violence, support, impact support for peace or not but also disagree in what way. This was first very important uh, studies. Second very important literature on how people see threats from different groups and by threats, we mean realistic threats to their life, to their property, we think symbolic threats to their values, identity threats to the view who they are threats to the social boundary and so on. So how all these threats, but also how boundaries impact how people see 
uh, the war. And for me, it was very interesting. We actually introduced several questions of history. Again, as uh, uh, Steve told, I am really always to see how historical perspective. So what I will be presenting today, there are several guiding questions of my presentation today. First of all, how frontline Ukrainians experienced violence and how they think about ending of the war, ceasefire, negotiation, cost for peace, how they understand the identity relative to Russia, how they think about their territory and wartime dilemmas, and finally, how they reason about war and peace based on their perceptions of history. So our survey included 1,800 people in three major cities, in Dnipro, Zaporizhia, and Poltava. So this is, is, as you see, we also in every city we had IDPs who relocated to the zone, some of them several times, and of course, local residents. So we try to provide as um, representative sample as possible, and we also applied those who understand statistics, we applied weights to make our sample more representative in the end. So let's start with what time experience, what really people think. And it's here, it's really interesting from historian perspective to see that uh, Putin uh, claims that he started the war to support and protect Russian speaking population. And what we found in our survey that more than 60% uh, of our respondents tell that Russian language is their uh, native language, they prefer speak Russian language, and these people are who the most affected by the war. So 60% of residents um, stated that they are affected by constant shelling. 15% of they do not have adequate protection. 88% tell that they concern about their life or well-being, and those who were uh, internally displaced, they of course feel it stronger, 92% concern. We also found that around 35% of IDPs reported destruction of their property. So then we speak about the exposure to direct physical violence. We found that 33%, third of people who we survey stated that they lost a um, uh, friend or friend was a neighbor was injured in the war. 23% told they lost a friend or neighbor. And of course, these numbers were higher for ADPs. 30% of our ADPs told they lost somebody close to them during this particular war. So of course, it's not um, surprisingly then, then we ask, what they want for their country after the war. We found that they want Ukraine's prosperous and peaceful state. And it was the main important for after the war. And three other most important goals were mostly territorial and independent. They want strong military, they want sovereign state, and they want full control over their territories. The question for us was, as you saw from the beginning, how exposure to violence affect support for uh, continuous war or for uh, ceasefire? And as you see, then we ask people, is it imperative to seek ceasefire to stop Russians from killing Ukrainian young men uh, as the future of the nation? And while you see the opinions pretty distributed with some idea that we need this fire, we need to stop um, violence, the effect was very, very different for IDPs. IDPs you see on this graph is those, um, the colors are, str are more stronger, more intense. And as you see, for those who are strongly affected by violence, for them, the uh, support for ceasefire was stronger. Also ask people, do we need ceasefire immediately, no matter what territorial cost, only under right conditions, and when we liberated all our lands, again, not surprisingly, we see that there is overwhelming support in Ukraine to, to liberate lands. 
However, if you see comparison in between IDPs and local respondents, you again will see that IDPs are more willing to think about some right conditions rather than uh, think of an uh, entire fight. And finally, when we put dilemmas for, because what people really experienced during the war, then it's really a lot of dilemmas which are very complex. Do we need to save life? Do we need to fight for territory? And people feel about the same thing at the same time, and they support the same thing at the same time. It's not as easy as we just ask them one direct question. So then we ask them dilemma, do we need to save life Ukrainian soldiers or continue war to free territories? You see that the position very distributed, and again, what is the key here is that um, those who are most affected by violence, they are more supportive for saving lives, while those who are less supportive by violence are more supportive for the fighting. And this results actually coming from many research outside of Ukraine. So next, what uh, we explore are how identity is social boundary. What was very interesting to see that uh, identification with Ukrainian nation was very, very strong across all type of population, but also even across ages. We uh, were thinking maybe that identification with Ukraine will grow, uh, will grow with the, the younger person is the stronger identification, especially for those who were born after the independence of Ukraine, those who are now in their thirties. But we didn't find any significant difference. It was a very strong um, support for Ukraine across all um, uh, groups. But what was really interesting is um, when we ask how you define Ukrainian nation, basically we asked, do we think it's as a, identified with Ukraine as a homeland for ethnic Ukrainians, which is ethnic meaning, as a uh, homeland for many different ethnicities and groups, multicultural meaning, and citizen of Ukraine first and foremost as a civic liberal meaning, we clearly see that um, civic meaning clearly prevails. And we also see that the civic meaning of national identity um, also very strong um, across different uh, groups. Basically, every uh, group in Ukraine, every age group in Ukraine supported this particular meaning, to, uh, to civic meaning that every person in Ukraine equals citizen of Ukraine. Almost also will be interest, also interesting how people see identification with European identity, European Union. Again, um, here we see more distribution. However, through the age, we found exactly the same uh, result. People of all ages were having the same um, approach, or the same view on a European uh, identity. And uh, what was really interesting also that still we have pretty big group of population which still identify with Russian culture and language, even during the war. Uh, around 15% of population who somehow agree or strongly agree that they uh, identify with Russian culture and language. And this is very important to show that identification with culture and language does not preclude people to be a strong citizen of Ukrainian uh, state. What was interesting for us to see how war affected perception of Russia, what so how perception of social boundary. What we found that um, if we speak about political boundary, that uh, people majority you see, see Russia and Ukraine as completely different nation, and also ask about norms of identification. What are social norms in society in seeing Russia and Ukraine? So both social norms and boundaries itself clearly states differences between nations of Russia and Ukraine. Then we ask about a symbolic boundary and how people see cultural differences between our people. Then you see that cultural boundary is 
less de 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 definitive. So it's um, a lot of people actually strongly agree that Russia and Ukraine have very similar cultures. And um, they also, then they speak about difference between Russian and Ukrainian people. Again, the difference was a little bit stronger, but again, cultural boundary was less defined. And finally, what was really interesting for us to find, it's a moral boundary. So we ask people uh, if Ukrainians and Russians equally moral, if uh, Ukrainians better people than Russians, if they have stronger spirituality, and both in norm, in social norms and in perception of boundary, you clearly see very strong uh, difference. This was really interesting findings that uh, while cultural boundary was not as significant, the moral boundary become the key how people, Russia and Ukrainian people distinguish themselves from each other. Um, basically how Ukrainian people distinguish themselves from uh, Russian. And we also found a lot of uh, negative emotions. They were, all emotions were very strong. Maj the most strong emotions were disgust, anger, and hatred. And in uh, my interviews, which I recently conducted in uh, Poland and Czech Republic, uh, basically every single um, participant told that we feel so much hate. We just overwhelmed with the hate and it's very strong emotion. Anxiety and fear was less important. Uh, but what was very interesting is that uh, most negative emotions were related to Russian leadership and military. But um, the people, uh, to, towards the uh, people of uh, Russia, difference were less important. So this is interesting to see that actually Ukrainian people differentiate between leadership and Russian people. And this is what actually now in a lot of discussion in um, academia and also in, in public space, uh, is it common perception, it's a homogeneous perception. In our analysis, we found that there is a differentiation and no, we didn't see any significant positive emotions or any empathy, they were not impressed at all. Uh, so attitudes toward peace and war. And what we found that a lot of people really see life of person and life of the family is very important for, for uh, our respondents. However, they also see Ukraine cause and war as sacred for them too. So this is the very important perceptions of the war, dilemmas of the war, then both life and uh, Ukrainian uh, support. Then we ask people, because of sacrifice of Ukrainian soldiers during the war, it is important than ever, Ukraine never concede any territory to Russia. We clearly see very strong agreement with this particular territory. So for people, this sacrifices, the life lost, is even increasing their belief that Ukraine should never concede territory, do not reward aggression of uh, Russia in Ukraine. Um, and we also have found that uh, it's not only personal feelings, and we ask about social norms. We also found that people believe that everyone around so-called descriptive social norms, we also found that a lot of Ukrainians see also their territory as sacred. Um, also, um, it's very important for people uh, undivided national territory for in the war. So there are a lot of sacred values, uh, and by sacred value is very important to understand. It means that something which is beyond bargaining, something beyond this is life uh, sacred value, which more important than anything else. Uh, then uh, we ask people what their predictions when uh, Ukraine will be able to take control over its territories. First of all, then we ask uh, back, taking back control of Crimea, we found that um, 
a majority of people expect it within one five years and uh if you see here that the um optimism is higher uh among people who were not displaced and people who were displaced show less optimism about this similarly when we ask people then they uh, crimea will be uh, then ukraine will be able to take back control of donbass we also saw that everyone expecting it to happen pretty soon and there are a lot of optimism especially among young people it was very strong around young people then we ask what could be the if at some point ukraine will um be in negotiation uh so what will be more important territorial integrity of ukraine or is economic restitution from russia and we found that for ukrainians territorial integrity much more important than economic restitution then we also ask what is important financial compensations or formal apology and again we usually um, in, in many cases people many uh, research show formal apology is so important um, uh, symbolically uh, but we found that for ukrainians now who experience the war and um, destruction of their country they believe the financial compensation more important for them and but was it more distribution than we ask what is important more reparation for war crimes or full cooperation of Russia with international tribunal investigation on war crimes. And we found that while some people still uh, want to have reparations, still the most preferred was full cooperation. So the responsibility of Russia, criminal responsibility was the most important for Ukrainians. Uh, also very interesting we run experimental design when we first ask uh, ukrainians how much do you support negotiation with russia on complete ceasefire and then another third uh, of uh, respondents receive that zelensky support this negotiation for complete ceasefire and another third uh, was tell that it was um, european union who support this uh, ceasefire and then we ask them again how much do you support and as you see here it's very interesting then if um people heard that it's their leadership ukrainian leadership the president Zelensky supports uh ceasefire they were more ready to support ceasefire uh rather than we see endorsement by european union and u.s leaders then actually support even a little bit decreased so it was very interesting for us to know that it's messenger matter who bring at some point and it's needed who will be somebody who will bring this and finally that will be i left the most interesting for the end how perception of history and attitudes it, um, impacts this so we ask um very interesting question uh leaving the us was a positive step for the development of our country and uh, as you see, uh, of course, there are strong agreement with it, but still there are some group of population who strongly disagree with it. And if you look into the age distribution, that you um, clearly see that younger people mostly disagree, uh, dis mostly agree with that here, while older people you see more. Um, uh uh agreement that leaving us was um so sorry <laughs> i'm this uh, i have turned it on back so again then we ask people if leaving the us was a positive step for the uh, development of our country then we see the younger people really see that yes it was very important positive step while uh, all the people see it as a more negative step also we ask all monuments to lenin must be demolished and you see here we see more distribution across and here is very interesting look specifically into regional dynamics you see that you see more uh, more disagreement with it in dnipro 
while in the middle in Zaporizhia you see some disagreement and the strongest uh, agreement in Poltava region. So it's really interesting depending how particular regional um, regions supported. Then we look into uh, age distribution. Again, you clearly see that um, with age, um, the younger generation, the more they agree that uh, they should be demolished. Now, what I actually uh, will also ask if great power always use Ukraine in the political game, and we also see pretty strong agreement. This position of Ukraine is marginalized through the history uh, of its existence. Finally, what I uh, run specifically for this presentation is to see how people see history does impact their perceptions of um, uh, war. And I have to tell you, I was really surprised. I knew that history would impact very strongly, but then I run, um, I will not present here correlation analysis or uh, regressions, but then I run some like quick analysis and compare, is it the language? Is it an identity? Is it perception of history? I found that the strongest effect on many of our dependent variables were actually from the perception of history, which are exactly showing and supporting this um, idea that real divide in Ukraine, real uh, position, uh, differences in positions arrives from this Soviet identity rather than ethnic identity or language people speak and so on. So here you can see how people see defending our land from invasion, then yellow, uh, this is green is uh, no, and two yes, do people really see this as a more sacred val value? You see that it's clearly um, impacted if people agree or disagree that leaving US was a positive step. Those who mostly agree with it for them defending land from invasion are more important. Um, the same if asked, is independence of Ukraine is important for you? Again, you see um, that people who um, see that uh, leaving the US was a positive step also have a stronger independence of Ukraine as a value. Then ask about peaceful relations with neighbors we actually see very different way. Those who believe that leaving the US was a positive step, they see more importance of the uh, relationship with neighbors. Then um, I ask about uh, saving lives of Ukrainian soldiers or continue war to free all Ukrainian uh, territories. Then we found that um, those who believe that leaving the US was a positive step. They more interested in saving lives than those who were, uh, believe that leaving the US was uh, a real good step, then they are um, more interested in continue fighting to save Ukrainian territory, including Crimea and Donbass. Again, when we ask about preventing more relocation of Ukrainians from their home, homes or continue to free all pre-war Ukrainian, again, we see this, the same tendency. We see that leaving the US was a positive step. Those who believe in it, they want to fight and to free all pre-war Ukraine. And those who uh, were uh, seen uh, leaving the US as a wrong uh, step, they want to prevent more relocation. Um, and then we ask if it's possible to ever have a permanent peace settlement with Russia. Again, it's clear, clear tendency that um, people who uh, see uh, dissolution of uh, Soviet Union as wrong step, they see more possibilities of peace settlements with Russia. So I will stop here and again, um, I, will, I didn't present here uh, graphs on social boundaries and so on because it was so overwhelming. Those who want uh, still to have Lenin status, those who saw the solution of Soviet Union as a mistake, have very 
strong connection to Russia, smaller boundaries, um, while uh, it's also they see less threat from Russia because we ask also perceptions of threat. Uh, while and but what was very, really interesting, while they experience less negative emotions, only one emotion was stronger. They they, they feel fear. This was very interesting for me to see the Soviet emotion of fear among those who support Soviet, more Soviet group. So again, um, I try to be as quick as possible and I leave um, time for questions. Karina, thank you so much. Uh, uh, there's so many things here. Um, uh, and I think like many others, I'd love to sit down and just kind of pour over these charts for a few hours to, to really try to, to um, help make sense of them a little bit more. Um, so we have lots and lots of questions already. Um, let me start with this one. And there are some that are sort of narrowly focused on this, some about the sort of project as a whole that you're, you're engaging in. But let me start with this one, which is, can you tell us a little bit more about the demographics of your survey participants? In particular, um, the question, and this comes from Jenny Freed, uh, mm -hmm. um, young men are off fighting, uh, and also some young women uh, are fighting or, or participating in auxiliary roles. So are the respondents um, more commonly women, more commonly older persons, more commonly people unable to fight? Can you just talk a little bit about? Yeah, I that? actually can pull a slide. Just a second. Um, so let me share a slide. So yeah, I have a slide which represents, so we had 42% um, of uh, men, 57% uh, of women, of course, which understandable. Age groups were, again, younger people, yes, were less represented, while we have equal representation started from 40 to 60. Um, this is education, as you see, uh, mostly of people who uh, perceive themselves uh, ethnic Ukrainian people. Um, and 99.5 were citizens of Ukraine. Uh, for language, is it interesting? 26% use Ukrainian in their house, 58 Russian, mix of Ukrainian and Russian, 15%. And native language, again, both Ukrainian and Russian were selected as a native. It's very interesting, this difference. Language which we use in home yeah. and the native language. And again, this is the result. This is the survey during the war, right? So you see, clearly see. So and all data which I present you, we had a special weights, depending, I will stop sharing. We had the weights based on representation of men and women age for each particular oblast and for entire Ukraine. So we did several steps weighting our sample so they will be represented. That's really fascinating, the, the the difference between how people identify as their native language and the one that they use at home, um, where I think we but would again, kind of it's, assume it's that a situation it would be the same, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a, and, and, you know, so many people who identify as Russian as the language they speak at home, but so few claim in, that they identify with Russian language and culture uh, in your surveys um, is, is also quite Yes, yes, 15% old, yes, we strongly identify, but they still speak. 58% speak, yes. Yeah, and, that's that's really And again, it's a fact of the war because then I was also doing interviews in Ukraine, in uh, in Czech Republic and in um, Poland recently, I just returned back. Um, a lot of people who, there are, again, majority of people who are uh, ref refugees, they're all from Eastern Ukraine, they do speak Russian, but they always apologize uh, during the interviews for speaking Russian. So um, can you tell us a little bit about this, so kind of back out into a, to a bigger scale for a moment. Can you tell us a little bit more about your um, uh, sort of the, the bigger goals of your research? Um, you know, what, what was it that you went into this wanting to accomplish? Um, is it intended to advocate for any particular um, outcome to the war? And in particular, and then also, I have a couple of questions here. They're mm -hmm. along the same lines from Sarah Albamonte and Steven Eisenberg, which is um, how and and whether you have shared the results of this research with, for example, political leaders in Ukraine, in Europe, in NATO, and you know, because it seems like I think to to some of our listeners that um, the 
the results here could be quite interesting uh, to, to precisely these kinds of groups. Yeah, so um, first of all, yes, what's the purpose of research? Again, I was involved in several, several um, working groups on understanding what to do about the war, how we stop violence, how we deal with it, how, but how we deal with the peace process without rewarding, right, without rewarding the um, Russian state. And I myself involved in other projects right now with Harvard University, we're doing analysis of peace processes uh, in um, uh, 15 different cases and how this peace process was successful or not. And in many cases, we see that ceasefire was a result of peace process. So you need to start talking before you even reach ceasefire. And in many cases, ceasefire was a beginning of peace process. So there was so much complexities into it. And we, you hist historians of all people know that every war finished with negotiation, right? It's at what point it will be and how it will be. So and this complexity of the piece how people how we prepare governments how we prepare citizens how we prepare ourselves then situation is ripe for negotiation what ukrainian people are really thinking about because a lot of um surveys before we were done ask very direct question right do you want to fight? Yes. Do you want to save lives? Yes. Right. So <laughs> and you saw it in this survey too. And what we did very differently is with the support of National Science Foundation, we put dilemmas to ask what is more important, life or uh, war. And you saw that people are really living these dilemmas. And I saw it in my interview. So again, the reason for this research, and I hope we will continue, we will have more um, uh, in-depth in interviews in the spring. Uh, I hope at this time more about peace process, um, complex peace process. Again, I really want to stress one more time, peace process does not mean conceding territory. And so for some people have this specific conceptual idea of peace. I don't know where, I, I know it's probably comes from very, uh, from some people we know um, who promote this. But peace process is how you restore the balance of power. Peace process is about how you uh, envision future of your country, which will be just for all populations. So there are a lot of, it, it's a very complex process. So the research for this research was actually to see what is important for Ukrainian. And we saw that territory is sacred. We really saw that the um, independence of Ukraine is sacred and people are willing to give their lives for it. So we should uh, strongly um, support and we should strongly uh, also trust and uh, um, respect this opinion. But we also see that people, especially those who are affected by violence, really want this fire as soon as possible. So, and this information, which should be complex, it should be complex information versus just rallying toward one particular way. Let me get your response to this. Hillary Barth, uh, who's uh, been a constant uh, in our series, happy to see you're here, uh, writes this. There's been considerable controversy on social media over the wording of the save lives versus continue war item. Critics have pointed out that it is not clear that more lives will be saved by ending the war earlier if it meant ceding territory, given Russian occupiers' acts. Uh, in hindsight, what do you think about the wording of that question and about those criticisms? And separately, and, and uh, well, actually, let, let's go with that question first, and then I'm going to get to the second question that she has, which is different. Yeah, so as you saw, we also asked questions about um, I didn't present all of them here, but last questions, what is acceptable for you as a peace negotiation? And we ask, is it Crimea, giving up Crimea acceptable? Is it giving Donbass acceptable? Is it uh, payment from Russia acceptable? Is it, and we found no. So it means we have clear answer for it. And the clear answer, which we can share and tell, no, people do not believe that saving lives worth conceding territory. So ending war doesn't mean conceding territory again. 
um, saving lives means that we at some point will start ceasefire and somehow we Again, uh, peace process is usually multi-layered. It should be should definitely not be between Russia and Ukraine. It should be between European Union and Ukraine as a part European Union and Russia. So, oh, and by the way, you asked me, I think, how we share information. Um, uh, right. of, course, of course, we do share information uh, with um, our governments, but we also publish now uh, multiple uh, short pieces in addition to writing academic articles. For example, the piece which we published in Conversations was so, seen more than 20,000 times and shared it even more. So, so um, let me um, ask Hillary's second question, but I also want to add a, a bit myself to it. So she <laughs> said, um, to what extent do you think the July findings uh, are still representative of Ukrainians' opinions? Uh, given the very rapid changes in conditions of the conflict. And so this is a, kind of a more general question. Is, you know, are you continuing to do this research? Are you looking to see changes over time? Um, obviously, you know, you know, this is, um, uh, you know, some of the articles, for example, you had my students read, uh, came out shortly before the the illegal and falsified mm -hmm. votes on annexation of regions, you know, and I'm wondering if you think something like that, for example, might make a difference in in the responses uh, if the surveys are performed again today compared to to July. Yeah, so definitely, that's why we actually because it was rapid grant is short, we actually apply in continuation, and we really want to have at least. I hope, I really hope, we will be more looking into. These processes rather than continuation of war, but we really hope to run it several times. And in addition, again, I just returned back from doing pilot interviews and all these questions which we were asking in survey, I also ran through these pilot interviews and I found basically very similar results, very similar variables which I was um, measuring uh, we were measuring in the survey, I found in my discussion was um, like the same idea of hate, importance of territory, importance of moral boundary. It was very, very strong. Um, and it's just recent again, I just returned like several weeks ago. And uh, we will be having more um, interviews in, um, uh, we hope probably have them in March, uh, February, March. So we continue. We definitely agree. I, again, I completely agree that what happened in July, now I would say uh, it will be a probably stronger position, especially now that Ukraine is winning, more support for right. ter territory, clearly. we can. But we also can see probably among IDPs who are really uh, tired of constant bombing and war, might be more support for ceasefire again. The, we will see, but what's clearly war is a dynamic process and it change minds every single day. Um, with that in mind, sort of change over time. So Vadim Staklo, our colleague here at Mason, uh, wonders if if there is any kind of congruent data that you can compare with from before February um, to see if, if positions have changed and in what ways since February with a war that's obviously been going on since 2014. I don't know if you know of any, any sort of other surveys that were done that might help to answer that kind of question. I know that, for example, um, Mikhail Alexeyev was running very similar survey, but they didn't measure dilemma. They just asked direct questions. And um, results were very supportive in the same way that Ukrainian sea territory is very important for them and uh, ready to fight until ter all, all territory is freed. Yes. Um, and I think they run it sometime in May, May or June, and we run it in July. So can you uh, can, can you help one of the members of our audience a little bit um, to talk a little bit more about these cities where you did the research mm -hmm. um, to explain, you know, the, the, the status of those cities, differences between those cities. Um, she asks if if they were in the previous, you know, so-called breakaway regions. Uh, I know the answer to that, but but if you can answer okay. um, to help that, um, you know, were any of these places that were part of those so-called annexed territories uh, by Russia, just, just to help to place where this happened a little bit better for her. So this is a borderline uh, places which are close to the uh, 
so-called zone of contact from 2014 to 2022, um, they affected very strongly in terms of being very, very close, right? Especially the Parisia and Dnipro. Dnipro, I would say Dnipro, the Parisia, Poltava, it's mostly in a it's between between uh, Kharkiv and uh, Kiev, so it's um, less affected. And you saw even in a result, which I show in that um, they have a little bit different opinions in Poltava than Dnieper and the Parisia. Um, effect was there very strongly. I actually, even just in in um, entire poll last year, I ran a project supported by GIZ. It's um, German USAID. Um, peace, um, uh, peace service, um, uh, and uh, they supported my project. I was actually uh, teaching history teaching in uh, Dnipro, in the Parisia, in all East, Western, U uh, sorry, Eastern Ukraine, this part on how to incorporate conceptual ideas of peace and conflict and conflict resolution into their curricula. And we had several multiple trainings. And in, in December, we actually have national level event where students from these history classes were actually speaking how they learn completely new things about prejudice, about conflict, about seeing the other, and so on. Um, conceptual ideas of violence and peace and all of this. So I was there, and you can see it like everywhere. It was, it, it's already affected dynamics, at least in my. Uh, training with teachers, they were bringing all these examples of really um, traumatic uh, discussion between children. So it was there even uh, before the war started, and of course they become much more affected after the fighting on the entire border. So um, again, on place just a little bit, since since the surveys are completed. Uh, here in in the parts of Ukraine that are closest to the front lines, um, do you expect that a survey of the entire population of Ukraine or populations of Ukraine elsewhere uh, in the country uh, would yield different results? Because it's, it certainly seems that in terms of, you know, political support for how uh, a war comes to an end, it doesn't matter just these locations. So I'm just curious if if you have any sense of what those differences might be. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Absolutely. But first of all, like why we run there? Because we really wanted to know people affected by violence, right? Their opinion specifically. A lot of other, a, lo a lot of surveys already run for the entire Ukraine. Uh, National the National Republican Institute run it recently, and so on. And uh, you clearly see, and the same as we saw it in Colombia, for example. You see that regions which were more affected by violence really want this fire and want and of violence, those regions who were not affected, they mostly wanted justice. So it's um, uh, clearly what's coming from our research, the uh, people who are more affected by violence, the more willing to consider ceasefire at some point. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more? So you, you talked a fair amount during the, the presentation in ways that I found fascinating when there were differences in age groups and when there were not um mm -hmm. because certainly you know i mean th there's there's definitely a lot of speculation especially before 2014 that political differences in ukraine were often as much defined by generation uh, as by region and especially about these things like the the impact of of the the ukraine of ukraine leaving the soviet union um what you didn't talk about as much um, were differences by gender. Uh, and I'm wondering if you found that uh, within your results in any kind of way, uh, whether it seems I, to make a difference or not. We didn't do it yet gender. Honestly, okay, the okay. database is so huge, right? <laughs> sure. Uh, but um, you will be surprised from other research. I don't know what will be in our research, but uh, from multiple other research on gender, actually men more willing for ceasefire than women. Um, and, they, and it's again, maybe because they're more affected by violence directly. Um, in my interviews, and I was interviewing uh, people in Poland and um, Czech Republic, majority of people, of course, were women, right? But there were several men who were wounded and returned back um, 
to the, and to join, not return back, but join their families. And one actually was who was living in Poland, but then went to fight and return back. And um, these men were really, really traumatized. And they were telling, we need to finish it. We need to end it. So, but again, it's the people who were wounded, who were traumatized. And... So um, Raymond Finstermaker, who's one of my students uh, in this class this semester, uh, asked, uh, you know, he says he's curious about how you conduct a survey uh, in a war zone. Uh, in in these surveys, when you manage to gather a sample size of 1,800, face-to-face, -face, these all, right, are mm -hmm, interviewed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering, you know, so so he's wondering how how did you find these people? Um, do you, you put out ads? Do you offer incentives? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. What sort of biases do you consider or work around, uh, you know, in terms of the, the people that you choose and what steps were taken to maintain safety uh, in this process? You can imagine that if we get this money from National Science Foundation, we wrote several pages, just several pages on safety, right? So, but um, because it's a federal money and so we need to ensure. So we, are, yeah, thank you. I actually, oh my gosh, I completely forgot to tell that, yes, the uh, surveys, we created survey and so on approved, but the survey itself was um, run by um, Kiev Institute, uh, International Institute of Sociology, uh, which I work for together, I don't know, 30 years, 25 years, with a very, very respected institution who has trained, very well-trained interviewers. Each of them has a tablet. We gave them the entire set of questions we translated them we um check how they sound in russian and in ukrainian they were in both languages check how they um actually we had a specific like a panel of people who was held like yes it's exactly the same with translation and i speak all three languages so it's easier for me and my graduate assistant also speak um, languages so it was easier easier to do this after that questions were created approved by international uh, um, interdisciplinary research board we uh, run the survey with 200 people and uh, then some questions come up and we were discussing how to actually change depending on what was the pilot and after change, we can approve the change. So it was a long process. We got grant in May. We were ready to do it in July. Um, how safety was, uh, there were safety procedures. First of all, they um, uh, were uh, working in, in the places where the access to uh, um, shelter was available. Uh, they, uh, Thank God that they never had a situation when they had an interview and it was a bombing, but they had immediately finished interview and lead person to the shelter. So all this um, um, all this was pre-discussed. Pre and again, uh, people were given a consent form and they were um, informed that this particular interviews. And people, again, yes, any survey, any survey, of course, have some... Uh, uh, selection bias. There is no survey which would not have it. Look at what happened in the United States. They never can predict how people elect do yeah. run elections, right? Never ever they go one way or another way, but never, <laughs> right? Um, so um, that's why we run so many surveys to to have this for the small territory. There is a some conceptual idea of power, uh, statistical power. And because we run on a smaller territory, we have more power to represent people because then you run like 1,500 or even 2,000 uh, for entire Ukraine, the predictive power will be very, very low. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, so my, my students read a couple of your uh, articles before. So they, they saw just a, a few of these graphs um, beforehand. Um, and let me ask you a couple of questions from them. Um, so Samantha Messina said, after you're reading the article that you had on open democracy, uh, she said, I recognized how you dis I recognize how you discussed the, that frontline Ukrainians prefer cr criminal investigation 
into Russian war crimes um, over reparations for those crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, while I understand the difficulties with holding uh, Putin and other officials accountable for their actions, she's wondering if there are similar moments in history that can serve as precedent for international prosecutors, for example, to ensure justice for victims of the conflict. That is, after coming through your survey, and I know you've obviously spent lots of time thinking about all these kinds of questions in lots of places around the world. Um, what kinds of, of sort of examples or predecessors do you see that, that might be most appropriate, um, you know, given the expectations of Ukrainians? Oh, it's a wonderful question. So, of course, we're speaking about Nuremberg process, right? We, of course, we're speaking about the International Court of Justice in uh, Bosnia. Uh, and it's the process when uh, people, those who are responsible for crimes, are uh, brought to justice, a very, very important process. And it happened in many, um, if you speak about the entire um, um, post-totalitarian uh, process in, um, uh, for example, in uh, South America. But speaking about serious crimes, this Bosnian case, of course, uh, Nuremberg process, and I want to bring you opposite process, and it was not done. And it was not done in Japan. After the end of World War II, there were no Nuremberg process because Japan was the only strong uh, ally of United States where all countries were turning like this into communism, right? China, Korea, uh, Cambodia, uh, and so on. So then um, United States strategically decided not to run this uh, process and only around uh, 15 uh, so-called A-class criminals were prosecuted and only a few of them were actually um, really, uh, I'm trying to remember, five or seven only were killed. And uh, uh, the emperor was never even considered for uh, uh, for being tried tried for his crimes. So in in this situation, we still see this unresolved issue between uh, Japan and Korea, between Japan and China, and this idea of injustice continue for very 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 long time. There, even Japan is doing everything and apologized like seventeen times. So one of the, the um, first charts that you presented, um, my students have some questions about it. Um, so this is the one where you presented nine different sort of outcomes or, or desires on the part of the population oh, okay. when war comes to an end. Um, and I think that you asked them to choose which four they Yeah, yeah, uh, we pick preferred. up uh, this one. Yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah. Um, yeah, we ask them to select up to three. So we're not seeing actually on the screen the one that oh. you're talking about. We're still seeing yeah. toward the end of your presentation. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can. Uh, we were seeing the presentation, that. just not the right slide. Okay, okay. Let me see. Um, share screen. Um, Share and um, let me see what I'm sharing. Oh, for some reason, it's not working for me well. So well, I'm, I'm well, moving, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. But basically, we um, we ask uh, select up to three, up to three um, options, and. Uh, let me close this. Let me see if I can just find this particular slide and then open that. Okay, this is I found slide and let me now try to share. Um, can you see it now? Yes, yes, we yeah. got it. Yeah, yeah, good, good. I just had to close it open again. So the um, it was asked to select up to three. So it means that some people selected three of them. Gotcha. But the most often was select. This is very important to understand. When we ask people about ongoing war, people supporting war, 
then we ask what they want after the war then finally everyone understands that at some point it will be some ending of it how mm -hmm. it will right so then people really want peaceful peaceful state this was more important than anything else and it's not because people then what we found in many many research then you prompt people for the future for reconciliation people more imagining future is peaceful if you ask people about what you're doing right now in this particular situation they probably will be more supportive of preserving integrity territorial integrity and independence of ukraine so um both i i think and and some of my students uh, have a, a couple of questions about this particular um question in your survey which mm -hmm. is you know when you limit their choices to three you're obviously determining what their preferences are mm -hmm. but not necessarily the things that they desire right it's quite possible that, that that they might look at it and say hey i want all six seven eight nine of these uh and and so so you know part of this the reason that i'm asking this um you know when for example only 13 percent choose nato uh, as one of their top goals it doesn't necessarily mean that only 13 percent believe ukraine should be part of nato right and in fact some of you oh, no, no. We, we actually have a specific question how important for you to be part of nature it was a separate question i didn't run it here so we did but, ask all of them separately too okay so you're 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 both sort of trying to determine then preference and then also support for yeah. particular issues yes right? yes we first ask gotcha. preference because we want to know how people think right because if you this is again institution of war if you ask direct questions, people will say, yes, yes, yes. Do you want to save lives? Yes. Do you want to, uh, uh, do, are you concerned about your life? Yes. Do you want to fight to the end of? Yes. Do you want to preserve territory? Yes. You will get highest 90% for all of them. But then our idea was really to see dilemmas of war, right? This okay. trade-off of war. This this is very helpful, I think, and it will it will be helpful as I'm talking to my students that we understand it better. Um, so one student asked based on this particular question. Um, he says, from your research into Ukrainians top goals for their country, um, how would you explain the differences in Ukrainians wanting a state without corruption at 26% and Ukrainians wanting a democratic state at 14%? She writes, uh, I'm guessing uh, that because respondents could list, uh, and I think in the article it says four goals. Um, she says that Maybe the longer, four, I don't remember. Yeah, I, I don't remember myself actually at the moment. Um, but she says, uh, so given, uh, so I'm guessing that because response, respondents could list a limited number of goals, that the longer term goal of democracy was perhaps drowned out by more immediate goals. Uh, but I'm curious to know if Ukrainians, for example, associate corruption in any way to previous attempts at forming a democratic government, or if they blame government corruption for any perceived shortcomings of the military, uh, especially maybe between 2014 and February 2022. That is, you know, how do you how do you try to make sense in the the different levels of um, support for for different components of of what we see uh, in this question? Um, you know, like like. Yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm just wondering sort of how you try to, mm -hmm. to then make sense of why they're choosing the things that they're choosing uh, in that question. Um, so I'm looking at it right now. So I ask how you please tell what things you believe are sacred in your life today in Ukraine and how you would like to see the future of Ukraine. So yeah, so we ask people just to select for us what's important, what is the importance for right now. I'm sure that if it will be war will be over, the idea of corruption will come up <laughs> strongly again. Now all people are thinking every day is peace. They think about territorial integrity, independence of Ukraine. This yeah. is the key for them, right? So at some point, then it will be like think about what's happened right now in election in the united states right everyone all these uh surveys polls that tell them yes people are concerned about gas prices concerned about um very strong um uh, economic uh, downturn they speak about issues of uh, inflation and so on. this is the key for people but then people went to vote for demo they went to vote for democracy right so it's dependent values they are very important but they also 
are very situational and temporal. Mm -hmm. And temporality yeah. of values is very important things which very often underestimated. Yeah, I think the temporality is probably really important because, you know, short term versus long term, like what can be achieved versus what they perceive perhaps can't be achieved. I think all of those are probably playing a role there. And it does seem that in fact, and, and it was wonderful, you know, of course, my students had only seen a handful of, of the charts, a handful of, of uh, you know, the, the questions that you've asked. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see the way that your various follow-up questions actually delve into a lot of this stuff even more and try to help you make sense of it. And I, I, I certainly think that that interpretation of everything that's going to be here uh, is something that's going to take you a lot of time to kind of think through, you know, what it all really means uh, in the end. Um, let me ask a, a question from somebody in our audience. Uh, Mark Gopin uh, says the prevalence of uh, of of history of, of the perception of history in these. Uh, questions uh, is really fascinating and the the relationships that you uncovered. Um, he says, what do you think are the implications for future peace processes and conflict resolution uh, or reconciliation processes uh, in the future based on on these kinds of findings about the importance of history? Oh, thank you, Margo. Good to, to have you here. I, don't, I could not see, but I thank you for uh, So the... Uh, I think the uh, dealing and negotiating history is very important. I think that uh, what was happening in Ukraine for so long, it was the agonistic, uh, sorry, antagonistic approach to history. It was a lot of antagonism. It's my history versus your history. I remember writing articles about the uh, fighting and uh, all the uh, veterans from Lugansk and Donetsk, it was 2012, I think, were taken from Lugansk and Donetsk and brought to Lviv to show there with red flags, flags of the country which does not exist anymore. And they were beaten by local uh, nationalist young, young uh, boys. So it's just awful to think how this, this fight for power over history was and how people were used for it, right? So they were definitely used to these people, right? They will just brought them on the buses and bus them completely different so they can march there with red flags. It's basically the same as uh, uh, orangists uh, were doing in uh, Northern Ireland, right? So, and uh, the, what I strongly believe, Mark, and like this is what uh, we should go as a conflict resolution people is use this new, conceptual ideas which come from philosophy now in the history of agonistic memory, agonistic remembering, where multiple interpretation of history can coexist at the same time and give an opportunity for people not to fight over this. Because I'm social psychologist. For me, history uh, is a belief, as a strong belief. It's a belief of particular connotation of intergroup relation. What people remember from history is what they done to us, why they done it to us, and what we should do to them. And history has very strong normative uh, uh, prescriptions. It's a very normative in, in its own. It's always oriented for the future rather than in the past. So that's why dealing with the history is very, very important part of negotiation, of peace, peace negotiation and um, I think it will be will be also a very important part of um, um, the process in Ukraine too. Oh, uh, you! I could not hear you for some reason. Ah, you muted. Sorry, I was I was muted. <laughs> Um, so I have time for one last question, uh, and, and let me ask you this one. It's based on one from from Melvin Axelbun uh, here in the audience. Um, uh, so, can you are are there surveys that are available that would allow you to compare uh, the Ukrainian population in the midst of this war uh, and people in the midst of other conflicts, other wars, uh, in other places and times, and in particular? You know what Melvin wants to know is: Does the Ukrainian population population differ in some ways from what we find elsewhere, um, or are they in in some sense normal? Like, is this a normal sort of typical response? This is a very good question, specifically because it's a old, like last question. 
because it's exactly what we're doing right now. Now, like in the morning, I was writing actually preparing the paper on uh, perceptions, how uh, experiences of uh, violence in different way, measure in different way, impact support for war or peace. And I was doing a review of multiple literatures right now. For example, in Israel, they just done several years ago very similar research, and they found that exposure to violence and especially traumas really decrease uh, support for peace. Um, and we, we measured trauma too. I, I just could not present everything because we measured so much. And uh, uh, so we. Um, uh, Oh, right now, for example, right now, I just got a text from my graduate assistant. He told that glad we added trauma because it's significant predictor for most of the war peace outcome. So while I was writing my lit review, my graduate assistant, Michael Stewart, uh, Swedgard, he was doing running aggression models right now. Like I just got text from him. Yes, trauma was a very significant predictor. Karina, thank you so much. Um, I'm just blown away by all of the work that you do all the time, traveling all over the world all the time. Um, um, but it was really, I think, important for us uh, in this forum um, to be able to hear a little bit of uh, what Ukrainians think uh, and, you know, to see that history matters uh, in, in, you know, in, in moments like this. Uh, and not just uh, that it matters in terms of, you know, the way that Putin misuses history or something like this, but that it really matters for the way that people see and think about um, their lives that's going on around them. I promise, I promise it will be a paper where we will compare impact of identity, language and perceptions of history and perception of war. I'm really looking forward it, to that. It's coming attraction, yes. Yeah. So, um, so again, thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for being my colleague. Uh, and my friend for all these years. Um, for everybody else, please uh, join us next week, our last session in this series, uh, but we have a really a blockbuster coming. So Ann Applebaum, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning historian, uh, a writer right now for The Atlantic, but of course over the years for The Washington Post, for Slate, for many other uh, publications, uh, a phenomenal public intellectual and speaker. Uh, it's gonna be a conversation, just me and her. She's not gonna give a lecture. Uh, so we're just going to talk, um, I'll talk uh, and ask a lot of questions about her books, about her research, about the way in which history informs the way that she constantly uh, writes about the present. Uh, so I think it's going to be a, a really terrific conversation. Feel free to reach out to me by email or by Twitter in advance if there are questions that you'd like me to ask. Um, but really tell everybody, tell your friends, uh, your family, let's really have a, a phenomenal turnout for this last event. Um, and uh, again, thank you to Karina. Thank you to all of the speakers who've been part of this. Thank you, Jessica, for your help. Uh, and I'll see everybody back a week from today. Thank you very much for doing that. Thank you.